Welcome to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith in the studios of our flagship station, Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. We're joining uh, on that station on our flagships on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99, which is also where you can find us on Birmingham Area Municipal Access and City Cable 15 of Southfield. Also, other community television stations joining us today on Comcast Channel 10 and AT&T Channel 99 live and live to tape are the media network of Waterford and Orion Neighborhood Television, or ONTV. You can find us also on the radio in the Birmingham, Bloomfield, and Troy area on 88.1 WBFH, the BIF. That is a service of the Bloomfield Hills School District. And find us online in a few different places. On our Facebook pages, facebook.com slash civiccentertv15 and facebook.com slash lakesfm, as well as on our website, civiccentertv.com. Go there, click on our Watch Live link. It's going to be in one of two places. If you're viewing us on your computer, it's going to be at the top of the page, second from the right, right next, right in between On Demand and the Carryout Club, if you're still, you know, using the carryout club from March of 2020. And then in the uh, on your mobile phone, it's going to be in our drop-down menu, top left of the screen. You click on a button with a few lines on it. It'll pop out a, sc uh, a drop-down menu, and then it's the second from the bottom of that list. Click on Watch Live, and all of a sudden, you'll be watching Civic Center TV live, and you can watch us right here live from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, Monday through Friday on the Megacast, as well as throughout the afternoons, evenings, and weekends for replays as well. You can also find us online on my Michigan TV or my my go to my my TV.com to learn more about my Michigan TV view the megacast live from 10 a.m. to 12 noon Steve Leto live from from 12 noon to 1 p.m. and other original content uh, on the docket for them and that they're creating including news coverage live events and original shows as well my my TV.com where you can also learn all the places you can download the my Michigan TV app on your smart TV and on your smartphone one more time, mymytv.com, M-Y-M-I-T-V.com. You can learn more about everywhere that we're broadcasting live and live to tape every day, Monday through Friday, by going to our website at civiccentertv.com and clicking on our Megacast link. That will explain what we do here, explain what the show is, the origins, why we started this show, and also give you access to every single one of our partnering television, radio, and other media outlets each and every day. You click on any of these links to our, uh, to our sta uh, partnering stations, and it'll take you to their websites. You can learn more about them, learn more about where that, about their coverage area, about some of the things that they do outside of the Megacast, and how you can view them live as well and listen to them live, whether it's 88.1, the BIF, uh, the Media Network of Waterford, or My Michigan TV, or any of our stations. We have hyperlinks to those uh, stations and their websites and other, uh, and other places as well. On our website, civiccentertv.com slash Megacast, where you can also find all all of our shows, the full two-hour marathon each and every day, as well as individual interviews on demand, so you can watch us on your time, or if you just enjoy the 10 a.m. to 12 noon live show with us every day so much, and you want to go back and relive the experience again later on in the day, it's always right there on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. And then, the most important website, uh, the most important page on our website at civiccentertv.com is our coronavirus page. There you're going to find a lot of helpful factual information from experts on the front lines. What a concept. If you're doing your own research, well, you're not really doing your own research. You're not doing the studies. You don't understand the context, but they do. They understand it. And if you're looking for more information, here's the place to start. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and the Oakland County Health Division. No one's trying to hide any of this information from you. They're trying to give this information to you and help you find it in a way that is going to lead you to the correct information from experts with some context behind it. Instead of going to your, to your you know, second cousin's great uncle's website on, on his Facebook page at mycoronavirusinformation.com or some crap like that where you're going to find false information, misinformation, disinformation, they're going to twist and turn everything. All of a sudden you're reading in a spiral and that's un and that's practically unintelligible. These websites completely different. Centers for Disease Control, the State of Michigan, and the uh, Oakland County Health Division, all of which have resources for information on the spread of COVID-19, on the variants of COVID-19 such as Delta that we're currently dealing with in this in this most present surge here in the State of Michigan. Information 
information on the vaccine for yourself, including the booster shots, if you've already been fully vaccinated and are considering getting a booster shot and are eligible to do so. And especially for you parents out there, now that you have your children ages 5 to 11 being eligible to get the vaccine, the Pfizer and Moderna, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, that's a smaller dose than the adult vaccine, but will be able to get your kids vaccinated with that. You can learn more information about that vaccine, why your kids in that age group should get vaccinated, the processes that it went through, and also in Oakland County and across the state of Michigan on those two resources. Find out where you can get those vaccines as well and sign up for appointments. We'll have more on that later on the show at the bottom of this hour. I will be speaking with the medical director uh, at, the Mich at the Oakland County Health Division, Dr. Russell Faust, about those vaccines for kids 5 to 11 and more uh, in context here in Oakland County. But you can find more information uh, at the county level, of course, and then also at the state and the federal level as well at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. In addition, every day before the show, we look across publications all throughout the state of Michigan for the most important stories on the COVID-19 front and beyond to make sure that you're staying informed all across the board. And we put the post a summaries of those articles as well as a link to those full articles so you can enjoy them, read them in full, support local journalism, and read other articles as well. And as always, we highly, we highly encourage you, subscribe to these publications, support local journalism. These, the, these journalists are doing amazing work to keep you informed in great detail about stories that are really important to you here in your local community, across the state of Michigan, around the U.S., and around the world as well. Our top story today, after the infrastructure package, has passed at the, at the federal level, how a $1.2 trillion Biden infrastructure bill uh, will be spent here in Michigan. More than $10 billion will soon be on the way to the Great Lakes State to help fix Michigan bridges, repave roads, replace lead service lines, fortify climate change, and make other investments after Congress passed a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill that awaits President Joe Biden's signature. This from Bridge, Michigan. Appearing at the White House on Saturday morning, Biden and celebrated the bill's passing with a subtle jab at his predecessor, Donald Trump. Quote, finally, Infrastructure Week, in closed quote, Biden said in reference to Trump's 2018 proclamation of Infrastructure Week as he tried unsuccessfully to reach an infrastructure deal. A little childish from the president, but, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, the bill, which has passed the U.S. House late Friday by a 228 to 206 vote with support of 13 Republicans, including Michigan's Fred Upton, a Republican from St. Joseph, and no votes from six Democrats, including Representative Rashida Tlaib of Detroit, represents a huge surge of money that it to fixing the country's decrepit infrastructure, including $550 billion in new investments. Upton lamented the bill uh, that the bill had become a, quote, political football during recent weeks of intense negotiations, but called the version of the bill that ultimately passed, quote, common sense legislation that will support critical infrastructure projects in Michigan without raising taxes or increasing the debt, in closed quote. Governor Whitmer hailed the bill's passage as a, quote, unquote, win-win for Michigan that will create jobs, enable businesses to operate smoothly and invest in badly needed upgrades. Quote, it will create countless good-paying blue-collar jobs jobs while helping us fix even more roads and bridges across the state. I am grateful to Michigan's congressional delegation, delegation for working to get this done, Governor Whitmer said in a statement on Saturday. Whitmer continued also saying, quote, uh, she is ready to work with both parties in the legislature to get shovels in the ground. A nod to the fact that once the money arrives, Michigan must still decide which projects should receive funding. If Michigan's still unfinished negotiations about how to spend billions in COVID dollars are any indication, it may not be a very quick process. Michigan, whose infrastructure received a D-plus grade in 2018 from the American Society of Civil Engineers, has endured several high-profile infrastructure failures in recent in recent years, from the Flint and Benton Harbor water crises involving aging lead pipelines, uh, to the Midland Dam failures earlier this year, to the toxic levels of PFAS contamination, flooding and erosion along its coast, and the pot hill filled uh, pothole filled dam roads, and closed quote, that Governor Whitmer campaigned on a promise to fix. But the Biden bill, but, but the bill Biden said he will sign is also far smaller than the 2.25 trillion bill he had originally sought. Still, it amounts 
to the country's largest ever investment in climate action, public transit, and other priorities. Uh, here are some of the ways in the state of Michigan that this money may be used uh, to help our infrastructure. Uh, roads and bridges. Michigan's biggest new funding injection from the bill is for roads and bridges. The bill de dedicates $110 billion nationally to the cause, more than $1.5 billion of which would come to Michigan. Still, it's far less than the $159 billion in the original ask from the president. According to Whitmer's office, it is set to receive five, Michigan is set to receive $563 million in order to repair or replace bridges and another $7.3 billion for roads. Uh, water systems and total infrastructure bill includes $55 billion nationally to remove lead pipelines and clean up PFAS. Governor Whitmer's office said Michigan is slated to receive $1.3 billion for water infrastructure, including lead and PFAS removal. Michigan has among the highest per capita, per capita rates of lead service lines in the nation, as many as 500,000 in total, but it has also done far more than any state to identify sources of PFAS after discoveries in recent years of severe contamination in places like Oscoda and Parchment. Uh, another, another thing slated to receive some money uh, in Michigan is public transportation slated to receive one point sorry one billion dollars in Michigan to improve rail lines and bus and buses out of a total 39 billion dollars nationally being dedicated to modernizing public transit and 66 billion dollars dedicated to rail lines. Uh, President Biden had initially asked for $85 billion for transit and $80 billion for Amtrak trains alone. You know how much the president loves those trains. Lastly, broadband internet. Michigan could receive $100 million to expand high-speed internet access to nearly 400,000 people, the governor's office said. The lack of rural broadband became a high-profile issue during the, the heat of the pandemic when Michigan students were shifted to online school. That was a near impossibility for many students and including those whose families couldn't afford to pay for internet and residents of rural areas where broadband doesn't reach. Money from the infrastructure bill adds to now flush coffers in Michigan that have been unheard of for decades. Michigan is still deciding how to spend nearly $6 billion in remaining federal COVID stimulus funds, and local governments, too, have collective $4.4 billion from the stimulus at their disposal. More information about where some of these monies from the federal $1.2 trillion Infrastructure, infrastructure bill uh, may be used here in the state of Michigan and more details overall from that article from Bridge, Michigan on our website at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Also making news today, applications are open to pay more than $1,000 in bonuses to eligible Michigan child care workers. Uh, this from the Detroit Free Press. Applications opened on Monday for a state program intended to pay a $1,000 bonus to each full-time child care professional in the state. The $350 million child care stabilization grant program was part of a bipartisan state budget agreement. A quote, child care is the backbone of a strong economy and child care professionals and programs go above and beyond every day to care for our kids, helping them learn and grow in a safe environment, Governor Whitmer said in a news release. Uh, she continued, quote, by bringing both parties together, we were able to put Michiganders first and deliver every child care professional a $1,000 bonus in recognition of their incredible sacrifice over the last 18 months. Expand low or no cost care to 105,000 kids and help providers improve their programs, and closed quote. Licensed child care providers are eligible to apply and can get more information at michigan.gov slash child care. Again, that is michigan.gov slash Childcare in this article, both the article itself on the Detroit Free Press page and the linked article on our page at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus includes that link. So if you are a child care professional and have not yet applied for this, we have that website directly for you to go there and apply for this grant, michigan.gov slash child care. Child care professionals will be awarded bonuses directly from their employer and do not need to imply how, apply, however, the release said. So you can learn more information on that michigan.gov slash child care page. Uh, that full article from the Detroit Free Press on our website at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. And lastly, if you are planning on crossing the border or have been waiting to cross the border, 
you now can do so. The Detroit Windsor Tunnel reopened on Monday to vaccinated foreign travelers. Whether it's to visit a favorite mall with family or to sightsee vaccinated foreign travelers at the border with Canada on both sides, we'll be able to travel again using the Detroit Windsor Tunnel beginning today. The tunnel reopened at midnight after being closed to the general public on March 21st, 2020, just before the pandemic began. And for the first time since then, vaccinated Canadians will be able to cross the U.S. border for non-essential purposes. The reopening includes land borders with Canada and Mexico and means Michigan's border with Canada is open to those coming to the U.S. by land or by ferry for non-essential travel. Travelers crossing the U.S. borders with Canada and Mexico will have to provide proof of vaccination upon request of Customs and Border Protection Officers. In January, foreign nationals traveling by land border to the U.S., both essential and non-essential, will be required to be fully vaccinated. The Canadian border opened to non-essential travel in August as long entry requirements were met as long as uh, entry requirements were met. Quote, it will be great to see our customers again, and we offer our thanks to the patients shown as we continue to navigate through this global pandemic together, said Neil Belitsky, Detroit Windsor Tunnel president. Belitsky continued on, we are happy to announce that we are reopening border travel to the U.S. through the tunnel to vaccinated non-essential travelers, and we will be working with our partners in the United States and Canadian governments to ensure a safe return to service, and closed quote. The toll for the tunnel at the Detroit Detroit side will remain cashless while toll workers on the Canadian side of the border will accept cash until the end of the year. Then cash will no longer be accepted as a form of payment. Few are expected are expecting a flood of tourists immediately. Those entering Canada, uh, including Canadians returning from an e even the briefest of visits on the American side, must show the negative coronavirus molecular tests results within 72 hours of arrival. Lawmakers, businesses, and residents say the costly requirement, some tests around $200 will deter day trippers, shoppers, and families for which their economies have yearned. On Monday, Windsor Mayor Drew Dilkins and U.S. Representative Brian Higgins, a Democrat from New York, will host a virtual press conference to highlight COVID-19 testing requirements to return across the border crossing, uh, by land at least. At, at issues are the mandatory PCR tests to return to Canada following a visit to the U.S. Dilkins said the testing requirements for Canadians to return to Canada, quote, is going to be a deal killer for most, in closed quote. Uh, he continued on, quote, our government has to find a way to find symmetry and harmony with the U.S. so that the rules are the same, Dilkins said during a radio interview on October 28th. If they don't end the PCR testing requirement, then the reopening of the border won't be a reopening of the border for most people, in closed quote. Transit Windsor's tunnel bus service currently remains suspended. Monday will mark the first time in 19 months when fully vaccinated Canadians will be allowed to cross the U.S. land border for non-essential travel, such as tourism or family visits. Before the pandemic, the tunnel serviced uh, 12,000 daily customers and 4 million annually. The Detroit Windsor Tunnel is operated by the Detroit-based American Roads uh, through a lease with the city of Detroit that began in 1998 and runs until 2040. John Roach, uh, Roach spokesperson for Detroit Mayor Mayor Duggan, said, uh, Monday, the reopening of the Windsor Tunnel in Detroit is another sign that our economies are getting back to normal and gives the workers and travelers another option to cross our international border with Canada. The city will continue to do everything it can to operate safely in the COVID environment. That full article from the Detroit News, as well as our other articles and important resources on COVID-19 from the CDC, the MDHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division are on our website, civiccentertv.com slash corona. Coronavirus. We have a really interesting show ahead of you today on this Monday. Coming up next, Jeanette Phillips, the executive director of Share Detroit, will join us on the show. Then at the bottom of the hour, as I said earlier, Dr. Russell Faust, the medical director of the Oakland County Health Division, will join us. We'll talk about uh, the ongoing surge of, of the Delta variant here in Oakland County and across the state of Michigan, the continued push for vaccinating people, including the, the boosters, and now the shots that are available for children 5 to 11 years old and more. At 11 o'clock, I'll be joined by Billy Wallwinkle, the assistant curator with the Detroit Historical Society and Dawson Museum. At 11.20, Sherry Finn Silver, the vice president of International Essential Tremor Foundation and the honorary chair and keynote speaker at the JBS Trade Secrets event will join me on the show. And then we'll cap, cap off the Monday edition with Jennifer Frush, the executive director of the New Hope Center for Grief Support in Northfield. That is all coming up next. You are watching and listening to the Megacast. You see certain things get reincarnated in your children. 
My daughter is very much inspired by my wife's artistic pursuits. So my daughter started making necklaces. She makes what we call affirmation fashion. I tell her every day that your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. And if there's anything better than being beautiful, it's being smart. And if there's anything better than being smart, it's being kind. And reaffirming that every day is our method of making sure her chin never drops. My dad wasn't around. And I remember riding a bike and falling off and cutting myself. And me never would just want to get back on it. People ask, how your children learn how to ride a bike? And you did. I didn't teach them. I just created an environment where they taught themselves. And all I had to do was be there. Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council. As partners working together to protect our water resources, we agree. Pet waste is the source of harmful bacteria in the Huron River. When it's left on the ground, it can wash into the storm drains. These lead directly to our streams. No filters, no treatment. Here's one thing we know that can help keep our water clean. Pick up pet waste and trash it. Pick up pet waste and trash it. So pick up pet waste and trash it. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. Who is struggling right now? I am. My son is. Many are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use. Before it becomes a crisis, reach out to MyCal, the Michigan Crisis and Access Line for free confidential support 24-7. Available in the Upper Peninsula in Oakland County. Just call or text 1-844-44-MyCal or chat online at michigan.gov slash mycal. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. I couldn't breathe at all. There was lots of talk about putting me on a ventilator. I thought I was gonna die. I was 39 weeks pregnant and had a scheduled C-section. During that time, I got COVID and was hospitalized for a month. I had a blood clot in my lungs. It caused me to go into right-sided heart failure. I was really scared. I kept texting my husband and my mom, telling them how scared I was, and I was worried that he was gonna grow up without a mom. And then I was worried if, when I did get home, that he wouldn't know who I was. You know, being 27 and a mom and a wife and having that all almost taken away from me. It's scary, and if a vaccine can prevent that from happening, why not? Get your vaccine. I don't want this to happen to anybody else. Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe here in our studios in West Bloomfield Township, although we're broadcasting all throughout Oakland County and around the state of Michigan uh, on a number of different community television, radio, and web outlets as well. You can find more information about everywhere that we broadcast live, live to tape, and on demand by visiting our website at civiccentertv.com and clicking on our, corona, on our Megacast link. Coronavirus link, also an important one, but click on our Megacast link to learn more information about everywhere that we're broadcasting and all of our partners each and every day. Um, for the next Monday, Wednesday, and Friday until November 30th, the Megacast will be joined by a charity uh, supported by Share Detroit to discuss the great work that they do and how our viewers can help them out this year as we approach Giving Tuesday. Joining us now today on this first edition of that spe special partnership over the next few weeks is Jeanette Phillips. She is the executive director of Share Detroit, joining us once again on the Megacast. Jeanette, thanks for being with us. Hi, Tyler. Thank you for having me again. I really appreciate it. Yeah, glad to have you back. For those that uh, didn't see uh, didn't see the last time you were on the show uh, and are just now hearing about Share Detroit for the first time, tell us a little bit about your organization and reintroduce it to those that may be tuning in again, but don't remember way back to the last time we had you. Sure, thank you. So um, Share Detroit is a, uh, a nonprofit that our mission is to bring hundreds of nonprofits from Southeast Michigan together on one platform so that the community, the public can go there to do research and find a nonprofit that speaks to them so that they can maybe donate during this holiday season, volunteer, attend an event, 
or shop on Amazon, Amazon wish lists. And our website is very simple, sharedetroit.org, O-R-G. Um, and so I encourage everyone listening um, and throughout November and December, visit sharedetroit.org and find, um, find a nonprofit or two that you know really means a lot to you. We're joined by Jeanette Phillips. She is the executive director of Share Detroit, joining us on the Megacast. And uh, what are some of the ways that your organization assists these nonprofits? Uh, you have them, of course, listed on your website, uh, but you provide other help as well to get the word out there uh, and, and to help them organizationally as well. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And so what, you know, kind of the key um, ingredient to what we're doing by bringing, right now we have 232 nonprofits in one place, is we're enabling um, the nonprofits to be somewhere where, um, again, the community can find them. So if, the, if a community member really cares about animals, um, you know, the Humane Society of Macomb County is on our uh, platform. Other Humane, Michigan Humane is on our platform. But there are many smaller animal shelters that um, do really important work that are less visible because they're just not as big or as, um, you know, haven't been around maybe as long as Michigan Humane. So it's it allows us to help the nonprofits be seen, you know, be more visible to the world, to the community especially. And also, you know, by having volunteer opportunities on our website, again, the community can just sort of Google inside of our platform to find hundreds of volunteer opportunities um, to support. You know, those can be remote skills-based or remote type work. Some are face-to-face -face now. Things are kind of opening up a little better thanks to the vaccine and, you know, and the COVID kind of calming down a bit for all of us. But um, hundreds of opportunities to volunteer whether that's at a soup kitchen, you know, taking care of animals in an animal shelter, um, helping someone redesign their website or their social media campaigns. You name it, there are opportunities on the uh, website for people to help and get involved. We're joined by Jeanette Phillips, Executive Director of Share Detroit. You can learn more information about, about her nonprofit at sharedetroit.org. That is sharedetroit.org. And so uh, 231 nonprofits currently listed on that website, and they're all local nonprofits too, uh, all with support for Detroit or support from Michigan, uh, for many local areas in the surrounding uh, vicinity of Detroit as well. Why is it important then to not only have this collective of these organizations in one place, but especially local organizations in one place as people are getting into that time of the year where if they haven't been giving already they're looking to as they approach the end of the year for uh, whether it just be out of the goodness of their heart or to get into the spirit of the holiday season or for tax purposes whatever the case may be why is it important to then have all of those organizations listed in one place for locals yeah, that, so that's it in a nutshell. No matter what the reason, we want you to give <laughs> during the holiday season, it kick, traditionally kicking off on Giving Tuesday, which this year is November 30th. It's always the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. But again, it's easy. It's easy to use Share Detroit, and you will stumble on nonprofits that are doing great work, great mission work, that you maybe have never heard of. And an example of a literacy, a literacy nonprofit in um, Northwest Detroit is called Siena Literacy Center. And so they help a lot of immigrants coming in from Africa are settling in Northwest Detroit, along with you know traditional uh, residents of Detroit. Um, so they're helping with ESL and foundational English, uh, reading, writing, um, literacy type things so that people can find jobs. So um, there, Siena is very quiet, very small. It was founded by the Adrian Dominican sisters, but is uh, not a religious, per se, a religious organization. Their mission is to help teach, teach adults. So um, that's the key is, again, if someone has 25 or 50 or $100 to give, or 1,000, um, to give during the holiday season, 
use Share Detroit as a tool to do your research, investigate some of the missions that are there, find a nonprofit that speaks to you. All of the nonprofits um, are tied to the to the donation side through PayPal, so it makes it very easy for a person to donate. And Mate Tyler, if it's okay, I just want to make sure I say out loud that Share Detroit as the conduit and kind of the the center of a spoke of all kinds of nonprofits and then the community around them, we don't take any funding. So when someone donates $25 to Siena Literacy Center or uh, Friends of Animals of Metro Detroit, that $25 goes to them. PayPal will take their kick like they always do, but we do not we are funded separately. We're, it's not, we're not taking any money from the nonprofits when they join us or from the community as they give. So uh, I think that's a real important note. It's a very, we have kind of an altruistic mission of just bringing the nonprofits together. And now with your help, Tyler, and everybody on this mega cast listening in, bringing the community to Share Detroit to do good to the over 200 nonprofits. And, and what's great about this too, Jeanette, is that uh, Share Detroit uh, and their web, and especially at your website, sharedetroit.org, it's not just opportunities to find these organizations and, and donate your money. You can also donate uh, your time as well. And, and get you get a, an in-depth look at each of these 231 currently nonprofits supporting Detroit listed on your website. And you can uh, you know not only find them, not only shop in the way that supports them uh, and, and donate, of course, but you can also find opportunities to give back through action as well. Yeah, exactly. And, and a lot of times, you know, people, you know, maybe they'll donate $25, okay. But by volunteering, you really get to know the nonprofit. You get to know their leadership. You get to know the clients they serve. So volunteering is a really beautiful way to support um, to support everyone. We're joined by Jeanette Phillips. She is the executive director of Share Detroit. Learn more information on sharedetroit.org. And so we're in this partnership with you over the next few weeks uh, leading up to Giving Tuesday on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday until November 30th. Uh, we will be having a Share Detroit nonprofit joining us at 1020 uh, in the morning uh, on each one of those shows. And uh, it's all leading up to Giving Tuesday. Tell us a little bit, for those that are unfamiliar, about what Giving Tuesday is, what the purpose of that campaign is, and, and how Share Detroit's really leaning into uh, that campaign for this year in particular. Thanks. Sure. So sh Giving Tuesday, um, I didn't know this until this year, but Giving Tuesday was begun by a woman in Houston, Texas, about seven or eight years ago. She just had this idea and um, it's become this national and worldwide event for, again, the community to give back to nonprofits. And um, I think they raise, I know they raise millions of dollars. I don't know if it's a billion worldwide, but they raise a lot of money. And so Giving Tuesday, the hashtag Giving Tuesday that everybody sees everywhere is truly also a different nonprofit designed to help nonprofits like me and all nonprofits do the right work um, to get the community to be aware. So it's always the Tuesday after Thanksgiving in the United States. And um, it's just a chance to reflect and give back before the hustle and bustle of the holiday seasons begin. Um, just think about how I can help. And so my message to your viewers is to use ShareDetroit.org through November when they have 10 minutes a few times to go in and do their research, look around, see what speaks to them, and kind of get organized for Giving Tuesday. Of course, they can give at any time. It's always ready for them. but. Giving Tuesday is a big kind of splash moment um, right after Cyber Monday. Um, so after they've purchased all their holiday gifts, they can um, come to come to ShareDetroit.org and, and do some good for our local community. So we're joined by Jeanette Phillips. She's the executive director of Share of Detroit. Learn more information on ShareDetroit.org. And especially in this year, Jeanette, uh, with the 
uh, difficulties that our nonprofits, much like our our uh, independent businesses, had during the pandemic. Why is it more important now more than ever that if people can donate, whether it's their time, whether it's money, whether it's just uh, shopping through you know, your Amazon wish lists for these organizations for materials that they need, why now more than ever is it important for us to support our local nonprofits? Yeah, so now more than ever, people are co we're coming out from underneath the difficulty of COVID. And so there are, there are more needs for more nonprofits now by the community, a la the literacy groups, um, organizations that help people with disabilities. We're getting out more, so there, there's more demand coming through. And also there's still demand in for people with food insecurity or um, you know pets, people who either have to surrender their pets because they just can't, um, maintain that sometimes people die right and we hope they don't die of covid but elderly people die and their pets need to be adopted so there's a lot of reasons why the nonprofits really need support and they ran deficits you know the other piece of the puzzle is probably 80 percent maybe more of the nonprofits in our area ran um, deficits so they can't, you know, they'll go out of business just like anybody else goes out of business when they their revenue does not match their expenses. So um, if the community can help at any amount, small or large, um, it's a critical time for a lot of nonprofits to make sure that they can come out of kind of the last two years, um, you know, maybe not stronger, but just at a break even. It's just, we, we need to help them. They do so much work, important work for the area. You can learn more information about all of the 231 current nonprofits that are promoted by Shared Detroit by going to their website at shareddetroit.org. Jeanette, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, Tyler. Appreciate Take care. It. Jeanette Phillips, the Executive Director of Shared Detroit. Again, learn more information at shareddetroit.org, and we'll be joined by a Shared Detroit uh, charity every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 1020 here on the Megacast now through the end of the month on November 30th. We're going to take a quick break. On the other side, we'll transition to talking more on the COVID-19 front. We'll be joined by the medical director of the Oakland County Health Division, Dr. Russell Faust, to talk about the current state of the COVID-19 pandemic and the spread of COVID here in Oakland County, vaccinations, including the booster shots, and of course, uh, now the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine availability for children ages 5 to 11 years old. That's all coming up next. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. Motorcyclists are hard to see. To keep everyone safer, it's important to always look for them and know where most crashes occur. 84% of motorcycle and vehicle crashes happen on streets, not highways. And most crashes with motorcyclists occur when vehicle drivers are turning left. So before turning, especially to the left, make sure you look for motorcyclists. Then look again. It could save a life. To Sofia and Gabriel, even though these old knees can't follow on your adventure to the forest today, these flowers represent my love. These stitches and threads join us together. And wherever you see a flower, a bird, a beautiful tree, know that my love is with you. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. 72.7% of high school students get less than the recommended seven to nine hours of sleep a night. This can cause pain, obesity, and can very negatively affect your mental health. When you have a consistent seven to nine hours of sleep every day, you get sick less often, lose more weight, and have better relationships with those around you. For more information about the dangers of sleep deprivation, go to sleepfoundation.org. This message is brought to you by the WBHS Digital Media Arts Program and 89.3 Lakes FM. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get your kids vaccinated? It was hard for them to social distance, to be isolated from their friends want them to get back to school and sports games. So as a pediatrician, I recommend the vaccine to everyone I know. The boys lost a former teammate and classmate who was only 20 years old. It's been a devastating year. We want to get back to normalcy. Our daughter is really looking forward to 
being with her friends, being a kid. It's the Great Lakes water. And so what people do ends up in our waterways. Flushable wipes are just evil. <laughs> they should be thrown away. They're impossible to destroy, and then they can cause significant problems. One of the main things when you're cooking is to not dump fats, oils, and greases down your drains. They stick to the sides of pipes. They stick to everything they come in contact with. Don't put it down the sink. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside our studio producer and board operator Calvin Brown in our studios here in Oakland County and West Bloomfield Township, although we're broadcasting all throughout the state of Michigan on a number of different community television and radio outlets as well as online. Learn more information about all of our partnering stations and find all of our shows and interviews on demand by going to our website at civiccentertv.com and clicking on our Megacast link. Joining us now is Dr. Russell Faust. He is the medical director of the Oakland County Health Division uh, back with us once again on the Megacast. Dr. Faust, thanks for being back with us. Hi, Tyler. Thanks again for the invitation. Appreciate it. So uh, things are seemingly becoming more and more normal, it, it would feel like, here in Oakland County and throughout the state of Michigan, despite the situation with COVID-19. That being said, we're still very much in a scary spot right now in terms of the spread of COVID-19, the surge that began a few months back. doesn't really seem to be showing any signs of coming to an end anytime soon. Where are we with that? And, and uh, what, what is the prognosis looking like right now in terms of where this surge may be going and what the timeline could be for it? Well, I'll tell you, um, it is a little discouraging. Um, the, really, the, the numbers that I watch very closely are the numbers of hospitalized COVID-19 patients in, um, in our hospitals here in county. And, you know, we had, um, we had been down quite a ways, but over the last two or three, even four weeks, we just kind of very gradually continued to trend upwards. And, and that is a concern. And, and there are many factors involved in that or, you know, based on many people returning to an in-person work situation, our colleges being back in session and on campus, we have international students back on our campuses. We have um, international travel back up. Um, and we have, you know, an unfortunate number of people who just aren't getting vaccinated. We're joined by Dr. Russell Faust, Medical Director of the Oakland County Health Division, joining us on the Megacast. Let's continue on the vaccine front. Because um, part of the issue is that, like you, like you just uh, finished with on that previous point, uh, we're still just not seeing enough people going and getting vaccinated. Where are we in, in Oakland County in terms of, uh, in terms of, in comparison with the rest of the state and the rest of the country on our vaccine on our vaccine front? And where are we still lacking in terms of parts of the population that have not gone to get vaccinated just yet? Well, I, I'm, you know, glad to say that we're in pretty good. Um, we're in pretty good position here in Michigan, and we're in very good position here in Oakland County. Um, so we can be very happy about our seniors. We're at 90% vaccinated and 65 and over. So that's great news. In the 16 and older um, group, and you can see I'm cheating here. I've got my little cheat sheet. Um, we're at 76.1% vaccinated. And in the 12 and older, we're at 75%. You know, that's all very good. Where we really need to focus right now, and fortunately we now have access to this vaccine for the five to 11 range, children. Um, because we know that um, though children are less susceptible to severe illness from COVID-19, there have been nearly 2 million children ages five to 11 who've tested positive during this pandemic. More than 8,400 have been hospitalized. And so kids still can become severely ill, can still die from COVID-19. And they are also susceptible to something called MISC or multiple system inflammatory syndrome of children. And this can be uh, devastating. And, and certainly many of those kids have died from those infections and complications. The, the concern is that children are often only mildly infected and it's written off as a cold, maybe a mild flu. 
And despite that, they can be transmitting COVID-19 to their family members or kids at school or teachers or others. And so I think the thought by CDC and FDA, it is important to get this cohort of kids ages five to 11 vaccinated. Fortunately, we are very excited now to have the vaccine here at County. And, um, and we're um, partnered with 15 schools throughout the county. And really one of our goals is to make the children and their parent or caregiver really um, comfortable in that environment. And so we're doing these vaccine clinics indoors in schools in a, a familiar and comfortable environment for those kids. You know, we announced it, I think Friday, we already have um, 6,400 children registered to be vaccinated. I want to um, tell folks listening or watching not to be discouraged. If they want their child vaccinated, we'll be able to get them vaccinated. It just won't happen today necessarily. So two places they can go to get their child registered, oaklandcountyvaccine.com or call 800-848-5533. We're joined by Dr. Russell Faust. He's the medical director at the Oakland County Health Division. All that information he just gave out in terms of uh, where you can sign up for vaccine appointments and call for more information. You can get all that by going to our website at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. At the top of the page, the third link on the top line there is Oakland County. I'll take you directly to their COVID-19 page. And right at the, at, the, at the top of that page is their nurse on call hotline information, uh, call line, email line, text line, and then quick links for the vaccine hub, all places you can find more information and get in contact with Oakland County for these vaccines. And Dr. Faust, in terms of the greater population and getting more of the greater population vaccinated, how critical is it now, not only in Oakland County, but across the board as we continue to try to inch our way out of this pandemic, to have this demographic of five to 11 year old kids now be eligible for vaccines where many of our, our adults that's been available to for the better part of a year at this point now almost, uh, we've kind of hit that full lull right there and this new population that previously hasn't been able to get vaccinated, now they can. How does that help further bring us along? Well, again, you know, this will help immeasurably and I'm really hopeful that this is a, a great tool to, to help end this pandemic. And the primary reason is that again, kids can become infected with COVID-19 but and transmit it on but never really be thought to be ill. You know, their parents won't necessarily get them tested. They, you know, every little kid has the sniffles. They go to school and they pass it on to their teacher or their classmates, and they can pass it on to family members, elderly family members who are especially vulnerable, and it just continues the pandemic. So I, I think this is an important tool to help end the pandemic. And, and then just, uh, just to speak to some of the vaccine hesitant or some of the detractors yeah. of these vaccines because they were brought through a process so quickly for emergency authorization uh, and, and uh, including for the children ages 5 to 11 years old people will often when they're detracting uh, from the vaccine or encouraging people against f being vaccinated refer to it as experimental or we don't know the future implications of this vaccine and all of that uh, are common commonly uh, thrown out there what do we know about about that, this vaccine to, to to tamper that sort of mindset toward this being experimental and being kind of a mystery and being just one big kind of petri dish that we're all in instead of it being an effective vaccine that's been well tested? No, I, I really appreciate that um, the ability to address that. So um, let me talk about let me focus on the the time to to market of these mRNA vaccines. You know, prior to the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, the record from start of development to end in clinical availability, the record shortest time was four years. These vaccines were available from the start of development to the end in clinical application in 11 months, so basically one year. And everybody says, you know, that's evidence of uh, cutting corners. The fact is, this method, mRNA for a vaccine, had been in development for two decades previous to this pandemic. And in fact, had been developed 
for Ebola application. And in fact, the mRNA vaccine as a method had been FDA approved for Ebola vaccination um, for, I think, uh, 2019 had been approved for um, Ebola. So these were, um, were well developed. With regard to the speed to use this as a COVID-19 vaccine, we were very fortunate in that um, unlike other vaccine methods, the mRNA vaccine is able to simply take all the method that had been developed, take out the message for a protein, swap in a different message, specifically for the spike protein for COVID-19, and now use that same method. So really the, the 11 months was really taken up by the clinical trials. Now, most clinical trials are on the require on the order of something like 3,000 patients to be to be um, examined using a new vaccine. There were more than 40,000 patients, 40,000, and the normal is about 3,000. So the FDA, knowing that um, this vaccine would be under the microscope, that it would be highly scrutinized, more so than any other vaccine in history they demanded very, very high numbers be in the clinical trials. They did the same thing for the pediatric clinical trials. Pfizer had been available, you know, had had their clinical studies available months ago, and um, FDA said, go back and increase those numbers. So again, the speed to market had very little to do with cutting corners and more to do with an available method that had been already developed for Ebola and other applications and, um, and that's one of the benefits of this method, the mRNA vaccine. It's basically used as a cartridge system and they can swap it out. Frankly, as a physician that's responsible for vaccinating our population, I'm looking forward to a time when all of our vaccines transition to a message RNA vaccine. We're joined by Dr. Russell Faust. He is the medical director of the Oakland County Health Division, joining us on the Megacast. And uh, just to continue on, to, to address another concern that often comes up with people that are either hesitant to get vaccinated or are against getting vaccinated against COVID-19, they bring up the uh, the waning immunity from uh, the, from these uh, mRNA vaccines over time, the, the need for booster shots or the uh, suggestion for booster shots down the line and the ability for people to still get infected and test positive for COVID-19 and, and then bring up the question often of, well, if you can still get infected with COVID-19, if you can, if, if this doesn't give you full protection going forward or, or it wanes over time, why should I get the vaccine? Can you address that kind of mindset as well, both the flaws in it uh, and why, despite that being the case, these vaccines still can provide such ample, uh, ample protections against COVID-19? Great questions. Let's start by saying the, uh, the simple fact that no vaccine is 100% effective. No vaccine in history has been 100% effective. These vaccines, in fact, in the short term, a year or less, have been close to 100% effective, well over 90% for people who are fully vaccinated. What we know about the COVID-19 infection, as well as vaccination state, is we know the immunology, our immune systems, effect against this virus wanes over time. And that's true of the so-called natural immunity that is becoming infected with COVID-19 or the vaccine immunity. Um, early studies about a year ago demonstrated that natural immunity waned fairly rapidly, somewhere in the order of three to five months. Um, vaccine immunity lasts longer, but despite that, um, as they go back and look at antibody titers, clearly there is some diminution, there's some loss of immunity. So um, especially for those who have an already weakened immune system, people with um, cancer or on chemotherapy or a variety, a long list of medical illnesses or ailments, diagnoses, um, CDC has authorized what they're considering a, to be a third dose to optimize their immune response. And for the rest of us who are either um, have maybe comorbidities, are especially vulnerable, 
are um, exposed to infection based on our uh, vocations, you know, physicians, nurses, bus drivers, cab drivers, et cetera, um, based on our potential exposure, they have also authorized um, booster doses. So, I mean, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't really project into the future whether this is going to end up being like the flu vaccine. Um, but, you know, right now, I'm thinking it looks like at some point we will require um, boosters. This is unlikely to be the last booster we see for the COVID-19, unfortunately. We're joined by Dr. Russell Faust. He is the medical director at the Oakland County Health Division. Joining us on the Megacast, you can learn more information about COVID-19, about the booster shots, about the vaccines for children 5 to 11, and sign up for your own vaccination yourself through Oakland County. By going to our website at civiccentertv.com and clicking on the coronavirus link and then on the Oakland County link or going to oaklandcountyvaccine.com. That is oaklandcountyvaccine.com. And you mentioned uh, comparisons to the flu shot. Uh, that this is a, a safer method and more effective method than the flu shot vaccine that we, that we uh, get every single year. But we also are in a year now where uh, the pandemic restrictions that were in place and precaution, extreme precautions that were in place in the first year of the pandemic are by and large either severely reduced or out of, or out of the cards altogether. That's reopening the possibility of a resurgence of, of the flu, a seasonal flu this year in comparison to last year. How much more important does that then make uh, continuing these precautions and not only getting vaccinated against COVID-19, but also the seasonal flu in 2021? Thank you so much for that, Tyler. It's a, as if I've th sent a script to you. This is a very important point. I really appreciate it. Um, the fact is, as people are loosening up those restrictions, people are back together face to face. As we're entering the cold and the usual cold and flu season, we're all coming indoors instead of having meetings outside we are going to be exposed. We've seen a number of other respiratory viruses peak in the last month or so. We expect to see flu do the same. So people should get the flu vaccine. There's no reason not to get your booster or your first or second dose, if it's that, of the COVID-19 vaccine at the same time. You can get them at the same day simultaneously. Just go ahead and get those. The big reason is this. If you happen to get co-infected with influenza, flu, and COVID-19, your risk of death is more than six and a half times greater than if you're just infected with flu or just infected with COVID-19. This is a big reason to do this, and it's regardless of your age. I, I want to say a little bit about flu because this is one of the myths that's circulating on social media. Um, I keep hearing that uh, COVID-19 is no different from flu for kids. And the fact is, children with COVID are hospitalized at about the same rate as children with flu. But when children are hospitalized with COVID, they are much more likely to require ICU care and much more likely to require intubation and ventilation compared to kids hospitalized with flu. And note that the COVID-19 vaccine is safer and it's much more effective. I wish the flu vaccine were 90 to 100 percent effective. It's just not. So I think this is a great vaccine. We're joined by Dr. Russell Faust, the medical director at the Oakland County Health Division, joining us on the Megacast on your radio homes for the show, 89.3 WBLD, Orchard Lake, and 88.1 WBFH, Bloomfield Hills. Uh, so, so, Dr. Faust, just another few minutes with you before we'll say goodbye today. Anything else that would be important for audience to know on the COVID front, on the flu front, or other public health information at this time from, uh, from Oakland County? Yes, and we're very grateful and excited to be not only here in Michigan, but here in Oakland County and be able to provide these vaccines for everybody's kids. Um, don't, don't give up hope, don't be frustrated, um, get vaccinated. And again, thanks so much, Tyler.
We appreciate it. Dr. Russell Faust, Medical Director at the Oakland County Health Division. Again, you can learn more information from the Oakland County Health Division about COVID-19, about the seasonal flu, and more by going to our website at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus and clicking on that Oakland County link. When you do that, it will take you to their coronavirus page, their COVID-19 specific page. We can find the nurse on call hotline, email line, and text line, uh, community resources on COVID-19, as well as a link to their vaccine Vaccine hub at oaklandcountyvaccine.com. All these places where if you want more information, you got more information. They have provided that information to you. They have resources for you to explore on the COVID-19 front, on the vaccine front. Uh, they have uh, expert resources that you can reach out to through the Oakland County Health Division to get your questions answered. No one's force feeding you this information. They're providing this information to you. These are places you want to go. If you're going to quote unquote, do your own research and if you have questions or if you have hesitancies and are trying to address those in an informed way, that's the way to do it. Start from expert resources, ask those questions to experts in your local area and get your questions answered. It's okay to have questions. It's not okay to simply seek out information that confirms the biases that you have. Research your information the correct way. Go through experts that can provide you the correct context because we're not all medical experts. We haven't all gone through medical school. We haven't all done research on the front lines of this pandemic. Having that information is so critical. And so we appreciate having Dr. Faust on with us today to give us some more of that insight. But you can also get a lot of that on their website, OaklandCountyVaccine.com, as well as on our coronavirus page at CivicCenterTV.com, where we not only have links to the Oakland County Health Division's page on COVID-19, but also the Michigan Michigan Department of Health and Human, and Human Services, as well as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at the federal level. We're going to take a quick break. On the other side, we will be joined by Billy Wallwinkle, an assistant curator at the Detroit Historical Society, as well as the Dawson Museum. That will be coming up next. You are watching and listening to The Megacast. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Two one one, how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. Joining us now is Billy Wallwinkle. He is the assistant curator with the Detroit Historical Society and Dawson Museum, and he joins us now on the Megacast. Billy, thanks for being with us today. Happy to be here. Glad thanks to have you with us. Me. So tell us a little bit about what's been going on lately over at the Detroit Historical Society. Uh, we are busy, busy, busy at the Detroit Historical Society. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we manage the Detroit Historical Museum and the Dawson Great Lakes Museum over on Belle Isle. And we are making sure that we have plenty of things for people to do this winter, people who finally have the ability to uh, get out of their homes and kind of want to stretch their legs and want to do it somewhere warm. So we got plenty of programs going on at the Detroit Historical Museum and over on the island at, uh, at the Dawson. So uh, what, what are some of those programs that are ongoing or have been ongoing that have really been attracting people back? Some of the more interesting things that people can see down there that have garnered a lot of interest so far. And for those that haven't traveled down to the Detroit Historical Museum or the Dawson Museum lately might be of great interest to them. Well, the thing, of course, museums are known for are exhibits. And we have plenty of new exhibits uh, coming in and that have recently just been put in as well. We have our 1920s exhibit that just got put in. We have a brand new community gallery exhibition about the, the National Organization of Minority Architects, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary here in its hometown in Detroit. We are making sure that our spaces are open for as many people uh, to experience Detroit history in as many ways as we can. So we have a Hudson's Holiday exhibition coming up. We have a Ship Models exhibition coming up to tell the history of Great Lakes uh, shipping 
and Great Lakes Vessels at over at the Dawson. And we have uh, other community partnerships, such as like the Mint Artist Guild and other folks coming in as well. We're joined by Billy Waldwinkle, assistant curator with the Detroit Historical Society and Dawson Museum, joining us on the Megacast. And uh, you also have some uh, very interesting events coming up very soon on November 10th uh, from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. You'll be holding your 22nd annual Lost Mariners Remembrance event. Uh, tell us a little bit about that event, what people will learn from, from going there, and, and, and uh, what goes into that event and who we are celebrating. Yeah, so Lost Mariners uh, commemorates and remembers the countless men and women who have passed away, uh, who have given their lives on serving us on the Great Lakes. Uh, the Great Lakes shipping uh, has a very, very long history. We are in many ways reliant upon the, the, the men and women who sail uh, on the Great Lakes to deliver us goods, take us places, help us out. And this shows our appreciation for them. Uh, the, the Lost Mariners Remembrance began on the 20th an 25th anniversary of the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald, which sank uh, in 1975 following near hur hurricane force winds in, the, in Lake Superior. And what this does, it is just, it takes a moment to sit back to commemorate uh, those people. And it's, it's really a unique experience because there are other commemorations out there, but there, there's no really, there's not one like ours. So we are an international event. We have uh, sailors from both uh, Canada and the United States. We, are, we have a flotilla of ships from the United States and Canada who participate in our honor guard and our wreath laying ceremony. And we really try to demonstrate the international nature of the Great Lakes because so many famous American shipwrecks are in Canadian waters and vice versa because just how intimately tied we are. Yeah, D Detroit and, and uh, the entire state of Michigan, uh, because of the Great Lakes, because of their connection ultimately down the line uh, to the Atlantic Ocean, so many different shipping routes uh, from all across the world, and especially through history, this has really been the state of Michigan an important point, an important point along the way for a lot of these shipments uh, to get from point A to point Z from all over the world and all over the country as well. And, and with that being what it is, of course, that's why we have uh, so many shipwrecks that have occurred there and many of them having been unfortunately deadly and so celebrating those mariners that ha who, who did uh, give their lives to continue to push our economy forward and, and uh, especially from uh, motoring that from out of the state of Michigan or through the state of Michigan an important thing to do and so you also will have uh, as you mentioned that this event began on the 25th anniversary of the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald you will have a special uh, event station for the Edmund Fitzgerald, not on the day of the Remembrance event, but three days later, November 13th, 11 o'clock until 3.30. Tell us about that special event station uh, and what people can learn about the Edmund Fitzgerald or see from the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald that they may not have been able to interact with or learn about before in other places. Yeah, if you can't make it all the way up to uh, Whitefish Point to see uh, the rest of the artifacts in the wreck, you can come to the Dawson Great Lakes Museum. We have the anchor from the Edmund Fitzgerald, which plays a, a large role in our Lost Mariners Remembrance Ceremony. But also, we are having another event with the Livonia Amateur Radio Club. They will be doing a special ham radio session on November 13th. And their goal is to set up their equipment at the Dawson and to broadcast the story of the Edmund Fitzgerald to other amateur radio operators, because radio played such a major role in the events that led to the, the sinking of the Fitzgerald, and it was really a lifeline for him. So we want to share the story of the Edmund Fitzgerald through their last line of communication, the thing that was keeping them going for as long as they could. And that is on November 13th, it's a Saturday, so hopefully you can make it out. And it's from 11 a.m. to 3.30. You come to the Dawson, you can check out the work that they're doing, and it's uh, really interesting. And uh, for Lost Mariners uh, this year, we, we celebrate different sailors every single year. So we don't just do the same ships or we don't just focus on the Emma Fitzgerald because there are so many people who have lost their lives, who have given their lives. And this year we're focusing on 1871, 
which is not typically what we do for this for the ceremony because we usually pick a few ships here and there but 1871 is is known by maritime historians as the year of the thousand disasters so there was over uh, 1100 disasters and that's everything from uh, running aground to shoaling to fires to collisions in that one year alone uh, there was uh, over 134 sailors who lost their lives uh, in that year and that uh, this year also marks kind of a, a starting a, a change in who's sailing on the Great Lakes because in that loss of life we have female sailors we have black sailors and we want to demonstrate that what we what we what we envision usually of safety on the Great Lakes today isn't always the case so this year was particularly bad and we want to remember those 134 who lost their lives yeah it's another year that with all those disasters of different various kinds and uh, being that it was so long ago and very early on in the uh, shipping and maritime history of the state of Michigan also really gives a, an important look into the development of those safety protocols that are followed today uh, and have been throughout history in the state of Michigan and also in some ways inform the general safety rules on the water that we operate now for people in recreational boating uh, and those that are on the, uh, on the waters and uh, including are uh, many boardwalks across the state of Michigan and lighthouse boardwalks as well. We're joined by Billy Wallwinkle. He's the assistant curator with the Detroit Historical Society and Dawson Museum. To learn more about all of their upcoming events and ongoing exhibits, including their upcoming Lost Mariners Remembrance event on November 10th from 6 to 8 p.m. and their Edmund Fitzgerald Special Event Station on Saturday, November 13th from 11 a.m. until 3.30 p.m. You can go to their website at DetroitHistorical.com Org. Again, that is DetroitHistorical.org. You can find them on social media and places like Twitter at DHS Detroit. And so, Billy, uh, we're still in the middle of the pandemic. Things not as bad and as severe in some ways, uh, in some ways and in other ways still as bad uh, as a year ago. But uh, more in-person events are happening. People are able to come back to the, to the museums. Uh, but are you still holding some virtual events or some virtual programming for those that may not be comfortable going back into these situations just yet? And if so, what are some of those that are available or will be available soon? Yeah, of course. Uh, I, I feel you. My, my wife's a high school teacher, so we got we to gotta play it safe here and there especially. So we uh, are taking that into account when it comes to Lost Mariners. Uh, it will be available online. We're, uh, we're working through to make sure uh, Wi-Fi on the Canadian border works just fine. Uh, sometimes it, it gets a little bit dicey, but we're, we're, uh, it'll be streamed just like it was last year. And also we're uh, making sure our third Thursdays are available online. This, ne this next one with uh, Peter Warby and Harvey Oshinsky of the Fifth Estate will be online. Additionally, for those of you who are comfortable with coming in, we have some really great in-person events. Not only are we gonna be uh, in person again for the Thanksgiving Day Parade, which you can come celebrate at the Detroit Historical Museum, but we also have an awesome event uh, called the Holiday Ale Trail, where we're gonna bring different brewers in to the museum in order to celebrate uh, Detroit and Michigan beer, because we were fortunate enough to have this amazing beer exhibit, which we've uh, gotten to extend again uh, due to uh, great response and also more people get to come out of their houses now. So we want to make sure as many people can see it as they can. Uh, but we're working on making sure we have virtual programming to go along with our exhibitions that people won't be able to see. We're joined by Billy Wallwinkle. He's the assistant curator at the Detroit Historical Society and Dawson Museum. Learn more information on their website at Detroit Historical. Dot org. And then a couple more minutes with you, Billy, before we'll say goodbye today. Uh, you do have another uh, another really interesting exhibition that's happening now through January 9th of 2022. Uh, it's a new community gallery ex exhibition presenting 50 years of his, uh, history of the National Organization of Minority Architects, or NOMA, uh, highlighting some of the uh, black and other minority architects in the state of Michigan and in the Detroit area as well, and the impact that they've had on the development of of Michigan's architectural identity. Tell us a little bit about this 50 Years of Noma ex exhibition that's being held right now through the Historical Society. Of course. 
Uh, NOMA, the National Organization of Minority Architects, was born here in Detroit in 1971. Uh, I was born at an American Institute of Architects conference, and they want to celebrate their 50th anniversary in their hometown. It was founded by a group of uh, minority architects who some met for the very first time at that conference, and they wanted to create a group to represent their views, their expectations, and what they needed to what they saw as necessary for their advancement in the field. Uh, members of NOMA have done great work across the city of Detroit. They've done work in Tech Town. They've done work in Jefferson Chalmers. And this really just highlights uh, not only Detroit and Michigan architects, but also architects from across the country. And this is one of uh, my favorite things about our museum is our community gallery. Our community gallery is not curated by the Detroit Historical Society staff. We bring people in to share their stories. Uh, our mission at the museum is to tell Detroit stories and why they matter, but we're, we're not uh, arrogant enough to believe that we're the only ones who get to tell those stories. So we want people to come into our space, put their stories on our walls, and make it so uh, as many people can see it and learn about it as possible. Uh, Billy, anything else that would be interesting for us to keep an eye out for at the Historical Society coming up or other information that uh, we haven't spoken about today? Yeah, uh, it's uh, uh, speaking of birthdays, it's our birthday year. Yeah. Uh, we're celebrating our 100th anniversary in t uh, this year. Uh, we were founded in 1921, and we're really looking forward to the next 100 years. Uh, our senior uh, our curator emeritus, Joel Stone, uh, has put together an awesome book about the Detroit Historical Society and the history of our work over the past 100 years. And definitely uh, keep a lookout for that book coming out. Well, uh, we will absolutely keep an eye out for that and keep an eye out for more ways we can celebrate 100 years of the Detroit Historical Society. Billy, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Two one one, how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources. 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected, get help. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. 211, how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211, get connected, get help. We may come from different organizations, but we work together to protect the Huron River for everyone. Neighborhood storm drains carry water directly to local creeks and streams. No filters, no treatment. Storm drains also help reduce street flooding when it rains. So clearing storm drains and the areas nearby of trash and leaves helps keep them for rain only. It is easy to do your part by adopting a storm drain. Find a storm drain, check it, and clear it every month. So keep storm drains for rain only. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. We as Michiganders feel connected to this resource in a way that I think is really powerful. Conservation starts with a caring, committed community. For me, you know, it's peaceful to have a relationship with the river. 
every single one of us has a role to make sure that those waterways stay safe and healthy, being careful about what goes down the storm drain. Just even eliminating some of your single-use plastic makes a difference. There's one water and it's ours to protect. Did you know that nearly 3.31 million Americans don't get their annual checkup? <laughs> Going to the doctor regularly is extremely important and is a crucial factor in maintaining good health. Make sure you are visiting your local doctor often and telling them about any health concerns you have. For more information, contact your local health care provider. This message is brought to you by WBHS Digital Media Arts Program and A9.3 Lakes of Town. Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside our studio producer and board operator Calvin Brown in our studios here in West Bloomfield Township, where we broadcast live from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, Monday through Friday. You can learn more information about everywhere that you can find us each and every day on our shows, live and live to tape, and find all of our shows on demand, full episodes and individual interviews by going to our website at civiccentertv.com and clicking on our Megacast link. Joining us now is Sherry Finsilver. She is the VP of International of the International Essential Tremor Foundation and the honorary chair and keynote speaker at the JVS uh, Human Services Trade Secrets event this year. Sherry, thanks for being with us. I am not currently hearing you. You might be muted over there, Sherry. You can take a look. There you go. There we go. I think I'm here now. Yes, right? now I can hear you. Welcome. Hi, Tyler. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. So tell us a little bit about the International Essential Tremor Foundation uh, and the work that it does to help people with essential tremor uh, in, all around the world. It's the organization that represents um, essential tremor patients. It's based in uh, Kansas City, and it's we just celebrated our 30th anniversary, um, I think it was four years ago. Um, the focus of the IETF is to increase awareness of essential tremor. That's the first focus because, unfortunately, most people have never heard of essential tremor. Um, and the second thing is to, um, to educate patients and their families about essential tremor. We put on seminars right now for the past, the past uh, you know, two years, whatever, with COVID had to do a lot of um, online, um, you know, uh, podcasts and and video um, uh, meetings and things like that. But basically, we do um, educational seminars around the country to let people know exactly what ET is, how to diagnose it, where to get treatment. Um, and then the third thing that's the most important is to fund research because we're always trying to find better medications and eventually a cure for ET. So, uh, so Sherry, tell us a little bit about what uh, essential trauma or, or ET is and, and just how common is it uh, in the general population across the world? Sure. Essential tremor is a neurological disorder where the um, parts of the body, different parts of the body just shake uncontrollably. It's um, the cause, they're, they're not 100% sure of the, of the cause, but it's, it can affect most often the, vo the um, hands and arms, the head and voice, the um, internally, you can have it in your your mouth, your lips, your tongue, your jaw, also in your legs. So it it can um, various parts of the body can shake. It goes from literally becoming just a, an embarrassment to some patients to becoming completely disabilitating to other patients. Um, debilitating. Um, sorry, and it's. Um, it, it runs the gamut. It affects 10 million Americans estimated to be just in the United States. It does occur worldwide. I literally was passing through in, in Peru once um, in a car and saw a woman walking on the side of the road. And it does occur worldwide. It occurs 
excuse me, it occurs um, uh, equally among both sexes. And um, yeah, that's generally what you see with essential tremor. Right now, the, the, the treatments, there's only one first line medication. First line meaning that the medication was um, established, was created for specifically for essential tremor. Other medications have been happenstance, like there's medications for epilepsy and for um, other disorders that that the person was taking that medication also had a central tremor and saw that their tremor was decreasing. So um, those are not first line, but there are um, quite a few medications, most of which um, are not, they, they maybe help maybe 60% of the population. So they're always looking for newer, more effective medications. And then there are surgical treatments. There is um, deep brain stimulation surgery. There is um, 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 MRI focused ultrasound. Um, there are some different uh, surgical procedures that have been developed that are very effective too. We're joined by Sherry Finn Silver. She is the Vice President of the International Essential Tremor Foundation and the Honorary Chair and Keynote Speaker at this year's JVS Human Services 13th Annual Trade Secrets event. And so, uh, Sherry, just, uh, tell us a little bit of, a, of your story. How did you get involved with the International Essential Tremor Foundation? Well, I've had um, essential tremor myself since I was 11 years old. And I discovered the IETF um, really through my neurologist's office and joined the IETF and um, eventually became a, um, a support group leader for the state of Michigan for the Detroit area. I was the, had the first support group um, in Michigan for the IETF. Um, eventually, the, um, the support group was large, very large and very um, active, and I was invited to join the board of the IETF and became the president. I'm currently the vice president, and um, um, it's, I've had essential tremor my, my, almost my entire life. But I had deep brain stimulation surgery, which is the thing that just changed my life. It was, I, I can't even begin to describe how it changed my life. It was an incredible, incredible, um, fortunate experience that I had that I was able to have that surgery. We're joined by Sherry Finn Silva. She is the vice president of the Essential Tremor Foundation, I'll say International Essential Tremor Foundation, and you will also be uh, the honorary chair and keynote speaker at this year's JVS Human Services uh, annual Trade Secrets event on November 11th at the Detroit Marriott uh, that is going to raise funds for, for supporting the Women to Work program that's been helping uh, women in need of a fresh start uh, for a number of different reasons for over 30 years. And, and so, uh, Sherry, what, what got you involved with this event through JVS Human Services and the Women to Work program? Well, I was asked to be the um, keynote speaker and the honorary chair, which was really took me by surprise that I would be honored with such um, such an incredible, I mean, it's an incredible honor. Um, I met, I went and met um, some of the women who are currently going through the Women to Work program, and it was amazing to meet these women. Their lives have been changed by this program. They, they believe that all the, the skills that have been provided to them, the self-esteem that they've helped create through this program, um, that it has really changed their lives. And so I feel certainly my circumstances are very different than the Women to Work, but I feel like my um, that I feel a kinship with the women because they also are going through something that is very traumatic for them. They've lost their, their jobs or they're going back into, um, the, into the job um, field and they need, they need to build up their skills, they need to build up self-esteem 
And this Women's Work Program has really given that to them. It's an outstanding program. And these women were just, they were so happy. I can't even begin to tell you how grateful they were for what they've received from JBS and this program. And so give us a little bit of a preview about, because uh, you're going to be the keynote speaker there. You're uh, the honorary chairperson of this year's event, their 13th annual event uh, in, in support of their Women to Work program at JVS that's been running for over 30 years. Give us a little bit of a preview about what you'll be talking about in your keynote speech and, and some of those key messages that you're hoping to get across to not only these women, but the people in our community that are supporting the Women to Work program. Sure, thank you for asking. It's, I'm really trying to get across how we all have challenges in life. Some of the challenges you can see and some of them you don't necessarily see um, the challenges that people are going through, but it's how we deal with them that's important because we're all facing something, every one of us. And it's, you can choose to you know, to crawl in a hole, you can choose to just stay back and not do anything about it, or you can choose to get information about whatever your challenge is and to, and to embrace the um, whatever is required to help get you over, over those hurdles. And I'll be talking about, you know, my life story, what I've gone through and, and the support that I've received and examples of of people who have also overcome very, very serious challenges, and um, and how they how they chose to live their lives and what they've done with it. We're joined by Sherry Finn Silver. She is the vice president of the International Essential Tremor Foundation, joining us on the Megacast. She will also be the honorary chairperson and a keynote speaker at JVS Human Services' upcoming 13th annual Trade Secrets event uh, that is all in support and raising funds for their Women to Work program that's been running for over 30 years. The tickets for the event start at $150 for the online event and are available uh, through JVS's website at JVS Human Services services.org. Again, that is jvshumanservices.org, that trade secrets event. Tickets begin at $150, the event November 11th at the Detroit Marriott in Troy. And so, Sherry, just another couple of minutes with you before we'll say goodbye today. Uh, anything else that you would like to say or, or speak about that we haven't spoken on today about the foundation, about your work with the upcoming uh, trade secrets event, or anything else on your mind today? I would say that anyone with essential tremor, because most people, like I say, have never heard of it, uh, to number one, um, go on essentialtremor.org. That's the website of the International Essential Tremor Foundation to get all the information you would need. It's, it's um, unbelievable in terms of what it provides. And you can find a neurologist, you can find, um, you know, different uh, support groups. And I think that's very important in terms of meeting other people who have the same condition. In terms of JBS, anybody who, any woman who is out of the workplace for many different reasons and needs to um, get back into that workplace, who needs to build up their skills, who needs to uh, build up their self-esteem in order to get back in there, you know, go to uh, JVS, jvshumanservices.org and find out about the Women to Work program. And anyone who's interested in coming to Trade Secrets event or to viewing it online, please go on that website and you'll find ticket information. Well, Sherry, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for telling us about the International Central Tremor Foundation and giving us a preview of the Trade Secrets event that you'll be the uh, honorary chairperson and the keynote speaker for coming up on November 11th. Thank you so much, Tyler. I appreciate it. Appreciate it as well. JVSHumanServices.org to learn more about Trade Secrets and get your tickets there for that event as well. And then EssentialTremor.org if you want to learn more about Essential Tremor uh, and, and or access all of their resources or donate to the foundation. Again, that is EssentialTremor.org. We're going to take one final break. On the other side, I'll be joined by Jennifer Frush. She is the executive director of the New Hope, Hope Center for Grief Support located in Northville. She'll be joining me next. You're watching and listening to the Megacast.
people are getting out to walk and bike in higher numbers. More vulnerable road users and higher speed traffic can be a dangerous combination. Crash severity has increased, so if you're driving, be sure to slow down and look for people. There's no need to speed. If you're biking, ride with traffic. If you're walking, avoid stepping into the road if possible. If you have to walk in the street, walk facing traffic. Learn more at walkbikedrivesafe.org. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources, call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. do a lot of worrying. Get your kids caught up on childhood vaccines to protect them from these 14 preventable diseases and you'll have 14 fewer things to worry about. Vaccines are safe and effective and save lives. So let's get caught up on vaccines and worry about something else. Get the facts at ivaccinate.org. We may come from different organizations, but we work together to protect the Huron River for everyone. Most of the pollution that goes into our rivers is carried by rainwater that flows off of roads, parking lots, and rooftops. The leaves and bark of a single tree can retain a surprising amount of rainwater. Depending on its size and species, it could be 100 gallons or more. It is estimated that an urban forest can reduce annual runoff by up to 7%. Here's one thing that we know can help keep our water clean. Plant a tree. Plant a tree. Plant a tree. There's one water and it's ours to protect. One of the things you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, physical appearance. They may be sleeping less or sleeping more and drinking more or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's a second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith alongside Calvin Brown, our studio producer and board operator. Joining me here in our studios at Green Media Center on Walnut Lake Road in West Bloomfield every Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 12 noon on our live show. You can also find us on another, on many other places for our live shows as well as live to tape throughout the afternoon. Places like Orion Neighborhood Television where we're airing at 1 o'clock in the morning and afternoons over there uh, as opposed to our live show times and other places as well. And find us on demand both our full episodes and each individual interview by visiting our website at civiccentertv.com and clicking on our megacast link. Uh, joining us today, our last guest, we're joined now by Jennifer Frush. She is the executive director of the New Hope Center for Grief Support in Northfield. Jennifer, thanks for being with us again. Oh, thank you, Tyler, for having me. Appreciate having you on. So for those that weren't with us the last time you joined us, uh, give us a little refresher about the New Hope Center for Grief Support uh, and some of the work that you do in our community. 
Okay. New Hope Center for Grief Support is a 5013C nonprofit. Our mission is to bring hope, healing, and new beginnings to children, families, and adults impacted by the death of a loved one. We offer free grief support through a peer support model, and we service um, everywhere across Michigan and beyond um, with some of our virtual opportunities to service more and greater links. Um, we have been around since 2000, um, so we're 21 years old and just uh, it's a proven uh, great resource for those impacted by loss to know that you're not alone after you lose a loved one. And so what are some of those grief support systems that uh, are provided through the New Hope Center to, uh, as you said, a range of different ages of people that may be going through the grief process or going through a different form of a grief process uh, based on what they've been through? Well, thank you for asking. That's a great question. So anywhere from just reaching out to New Hope, um, we offer first steps. We have um, opportunities to connect one-to-one -one with others in our organization that have similar loss and around the same age. We have 19 ongoing support groups that are loss specific. We offer an eight week workshop called From Grief to New Hope twice a year. And this is an amazing educational component allowing grievers to connect with individuals that have experienced similar loss and around the same age. We offer our several seminars. We actually have one coming up November 20th and November 22nd called Hope for the Holidays. And those are for grievers that, uh, you know, are, are grieving for the first time or maybe new in their grief. Um, and the holidays can be difficult. So just kind of giving them some information, guidance and support during that time. And then we have um, a seminar called Beginning the Grief Journey that we will launch at the beginning of 2022. So lots of opportunities, whether it be ongoing support groups or in specific programs and seminars. And then um, we reach out and we support uh, the community, whether it be outreach in the schools after a law or uh, educators become more grief sensitive. And then, um, you know, if there's a business or an organization that have lost someone and, and the staff or team are struggling, we'll go out and support as well. So anywhere we can support all of our programs and services are free to individual grievers and just um, know that the grief journey, you do not have to be alone. We're joined by Jennifer Frush. She is the executive director of the New Hope Center for Grief Support, located in Northville, joining us on the Megacast. And so uh, you mentioned a lot of these different programs you have are, are group-based uh, are group based programs or peer support programs. Are there also individual or one-to-one -one, uh, systems that are in place for people that maybe are new in their grief or maybe uh, better or may feel more comfortable or may feel it's, it's better for them in their current uh, in, as they currently stand in their grief process, to have a one-on-one -on -one interaction instead of being in such a group setting. Absolutely. What we will do is um, when someone reaches out to us, um, we spend a lot of time um, giving them a, a safe space to share their story and then um, allowing us to decide what, what would be the best fit. So maybe partnering them with someone within the organization that has experienced a similar loss and around the same age um, to get started. However, part of the grief work, um, part of our founding principle is being able to say, to find the words to describe your loss say them out loud and know that they've been heard. So it's really important to be able to talk about it. So whether it be on a one-to-one -one basis or in a group setting, um, that is part of the grief journey and that we're here to help them walk through. So there are opportunities one-to-one, -one, but eventually we try to get them into a group so they can experience that opportunity to find those words, say them out loud and know that they've been heard. So Jennifer, who are these programs available to and, and how can people utilize the services of the New Hope Center if they're going through uh, a recent or even a past loss and they, and this need some support? All right, you can call us at 248-348-0115. You can check us out on the web at www.newhopecenter.net or you can email griefhelp at newhopecenter.net and one of our 
team or staff members will um, immediately get back in touch with you uh, or answer the call when you reach out and we'll get them plugged in. And our programs are available to everyone and anyone. Um, they are free of charge. So I encourage you to reach out and get connected. Um, if you know of someone that has lost a loved one and you want to help care or you know express your concern, um, please feel free to reach out and get a brochure and, and mail it to that friend that has been impacted by loss. We're joined by Jennifer Frush. She is the executive director of the New Hope Center for Grief Support located in Northfield. You can learn more information uh, by going to their website at newhopecenter.net. Again, that is newhopecenter.net. And currently you have an, uh, an art exhibit or you will soon have an art exhibit in about 10 days on November 18th from 5 to 7 p.m. You'll be holding a What Grief Means to Me art exhibit. Where will that be located and what can people expect uh, when they visit this art exhibit? Okay, so yes, we are hosting an art exhibit. So first and foremost, if you know of any children that have been impacted by loss, this coming Friday, the 12th, we'll be hosting our Family Friday. And this is where we will be asking our participants, our kids, um, to express what grief means to them. Um, they'll have a canvas, paint, brushes, and they'll create what grief looks like to them. Um, at, at that evening, we will also ask to interview them. So we will have um, um, you know, feed if they can't be with us on the actual exhibit. Now, the exhibit is being held on November 18th, and this is um, November 18th is National Children's Grief Awareness Day. And this is just to bring awareness that children grieve. Um, when you lose someone that young, you continue to grieve that loss developmentally based on where you're at. And so children um, carry that loss with them throughout their whole academic career. So really making sure that they have support systems at home, in school, and in the community. So we ask the community to partner with us. And um, one way we can do that is help educate people about um, what grief is for children. So we will open up in our exhibit on November 18th and 19th. There are uh, three different time slots that you can sign up for. And this is an opportunity to check out what grief means to the participants of our program and, and really just become better educated on grief and loss and how to support our kids um, through their grief journey. So we're super excited. If you're interested, check it out on our website, check us out on Facebook. Um, there's a link to get signed up. On November 18th, the exhibit will be held from five to seven here at our center in Northville. And that address is 133 West Main Street, Suite 113, Northville, Michigan 48167. We're in the Northville Square Mall. We're joined by Jennifer Frush, Executive Director at the New Hope Center for Grief Support in Northfield. Joining us on the Megacast, if you'd like to learn more about the New Hope Center or uh, learn more about their What Grief Means to Me art exhibit, as Jennifer said, November 18th from 5 to 7 p.m. at their location in Northfield, go to their website at newhopecenter.net. Again, that is newhopecenter.net. And then you mentioned earlier the uh, New Hope's Merry Little Christmas Party. It's a holiday fundraiser, uh, again, will be hosted at the Northville Square. Tell us a little bit more um, about that event and just how essential in a year like this, uh, especially with uh, what 2020 did to so many of our nonprofits, why it's so important right now, uh, maybe even more than ever before, for a nonprofit like yours to have a fundraiser like this be successful so you can continue to provide these services to people who are grieving all across our local area. All right, that's awesome. Thank you for plugging that. Our December 3rd, we're hosting a Merry Little Christmas fundraiser here at our center. Um, the whole mall will be opened up for a strolling appetizer, um, as well as a cash bar through the, the sports tent. There'll be activities for kids, um, pictures with Santa, a DJ for dancing. So it's just a very festive, fun, interactive family event where you can come out and support a wonderful cause. Um, just grief and loss are something that uh, happened to all of us. Just um, it's a universal life experience that we have, and it's based on their unique relationship to the individual we lost. So just um, everybody at some point will experience the death of a loved one. So just knowing how, uh, there's a resource that can help. Um, and, and this past year, it's been uh, it, 
phenomenal, the, the success that we've had in getting people connected and providing that grief support. Um, during such an isolating time, and for many people that have lost a loved one, during COVID or due to COVID have unique challenges. Um, you know, sometimes they weren't able to see their loved one. Um, they couldn't be in the hospital and, and oftentimes they didn't have the opportunity to say goodbye. Um, right now, many funeral services or end of life ceremonies are just taking place, uh, you know, for someone that was lost over the last 18 months. So there is closure happening, but not everybody had that. Uh, so just being really sensitive um, to those unique needs of those grievers. And even for grievers that lost someone maybe 10 years ago, that extended isolation um, really re-harvested unresolved grief. So we were able to support people that were further out in their grief journey, but also um, you know, those impacted during this time. We're joined by Jennifer Frush, the Executive Director of the New Hope Center for Grief Support, located in Northville. Learn more information on their website, newhopecenter.net. And so Jennifer, you mentioned uh, uh, earlier on as we were speaking uh, about the New Hope Center that um, the holidays can have a big impact on people that are going through uh, the grieving process, especially if it's a you know an anniversary or if it's the first holiday without a certain loved one or certain loved ones. This can be a really difficult time. Uh, talk, tell us about uh, how the New Hope Center, uh, the New Hope Center's approach, or, or your advice for people that are interacting with others that may be grieving during this time of the year, which can be a really tough time for for them uh, as they're acclimating to life after loss. Great question. First and foremost, I want to just share the upcoming Hope for the Holiday Seminar. There's an opportunity to participate in that on November 20th. It's from 9 until 1130 at War Church, or you can participate virtually. And then there's also another Hope for the Holiday at First Presbyterian Church on Monday. November 22nd at 6 p.m. I highly recommend anybody that's been impacted by a loss to participate. Um, what we do is we have two individuals talk about um, how they handled the loss and the holidays. So navigating those holidays and traditions, some people choose to continue the traditions and some just feel it's too difficult without their lost loved one. So we talk about how the stress of the upcoming holiday can often just be just that. It's the anticipation of that upcoming holiday. And when it actually gets there, it's not so bad. But we spend a lot of time talking about a plan, your plan, what is my plan as a griever? So giving yourself a lot of grace and um, you have an out um, driving separate to a holiday function. So if and when you feel the need that you need to be alone, um, you have the opportunity to leave because your vehicle's there. Or if you know someone that is grieving, reach out and connect with them. Just let them know you're thinking about them and you'd love to talk or get coffee. Um, just connection so they know that um, you're prepared to sit with them in their pain. Uh, it's a difficult time for many um, without their loved one. We're joined by Jennifer Frush. She is the executive director of the New Hope Center for Grief Support in Northville, joining us on the Megacast today. Uh, and and, and how, how is it for children, too, during this time also? Because for a lot of them, if they've lost a parent or a close loved one, that's not only going to have a big impact on uh, that time of the, on, on them psychologically this time of the year, but also it can be a, a big sticking point in the development as well uh, to then go through the holidays where everyone else is celebrating, you know, they're celebrating the season, celebrating with their families, and now they're in a difficult position where they're not. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one great thing about New Hope. It is allows them to connect with other people and oftentimes kids in their class or in their school, in their community, that they to, they can see to have lost someone. So they're not alone in their grief. Um, and then a, one thing that we acknowledge is the holidays are difficult. And oftentimes these kids, um, their parents, whether they've lost a parent or a sibling, you know, it, it could be hard for the parent that's grieving as well as the child. So in December, um, we will actually be helping the kids make some really great gifts for their loved ones. Um, we have a staff member who shares uh, when she lost her dad uh, at the age of six, that nobody, you know, who was taking them shopping for her mom. And that was really important to those kids that they provide a gift to their mom. So we really 
acknowledge that these kids might not have the opportunity or parents might not have the means if they're financially impacted by a loss of a spouse. So we actually get to help the kids make a really fun, creative gift for their lost lo for their loved ones that are survived. And we help them wrap it and decorate and we have a fun festive event, but also it's to know that New Hope is their family. We will be here now, um, you know, at, at the start of their great journey, but through the rest of their life, should they decide they need to continue their support. And so, uh, Jennifer, just another minute with you before we'll say goodbye today. Anything else that would be important for our audience to know about uh, the New Hope Center at this at this moment of time, or anything else you'd like to speak about today before we let you go? Oh, thank you. Um, you know, if you are looking for a great opportunity to get involved um, and to serve in honor of a lost loved one or just to be part of a wonderful cause that brings hope and healing to so many, please check us out on the website. And if you um, are feeling generous and, and want to help, um, you know, support a kid through Kids Camp or a griever through the eight week workshop, please consider donating. And you can do that at our website, www.newhopecenter.net. Thank you again for having us. Appreciate it. Again, newhopecenter.net to learn more information and to donate to the New Hope Center for Grief Support in Northville. And, and, and for uh, more information on their services, you can also call their number 248-348-0115. Again, 248-348-0115. That is going to do it for today's edition of the Megacast. With about a minute and a half left, I'd like to give a big thank you to everyone that's joined us on today's edition of the Megacast. Of course, Jennifer Frush, the Executive Director of the New Hope Center for Grief Support in Northville. Sherry Finseller, the Vice President of the International Essential Tremor Foundation and also the keynote speaker at the upcoming JVS Human Services Trade Secrets event on November 11th at the Detroit Marriott. You can learn more information at jvshumanservices.org. A big thank you to Billy Wallwinkle from the Detroit Historical Society and Dawson Museum for joining us. Dr. Russell Faust from the Oakland County Health Division, where you can learn more information uh, on our Civic Center TV coronavirus page by clicking on Oakland County and go there and learn more about everything you need to know on the COVID-19 front. And of course, uh, to our first guest of the day today, today that joined us at 1020, Jeanette Phillips, the Executive Director of Share Detroit, as we'll be joined by a Share Detroit supported charity Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 1020 now through November 30th. I highly encourage you to watch that back, and you can do that by going to our website at civiccentertv.com and clicking on Megacast. There, you'll have access through our watchful episodes and watchful interviews link to find everything that we've done on the Megacast dating all the way back to March of 2020 and including today's show, which will be posted later on this afternoon. Uh, and you can watch all of our interviews and all of our full episodes and learn more about the many different people and organizations that we are talking about each and every day. Then our Civic Center TV coronavirus page, also a big a big place you want to be going each and every day to learn more about COVID-19, especially following up on some of that information you may have learned today from Dr. Russell Faust at 1040 in our interview with him. There we also have links for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and the Oakland County Health Division, so you can learn more about the COVID-19 pandemic, the spread of the, of the virus, the vaccine, scenes, uh, booster shots, where you can get uh, immunized, as well as all the information you need to know on precautions and other measures in place in Oakland County. And find all the news that's making headlines across the state of Michigan, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Big thank you as well to our crew each and every day on the show today. Joining me in the studio as always, Calvin Brown, our studio producer and board operator, our Zoom producer, Jared Clark, and our booking producer, Larry Nyland. Coming up next on Civic Center TV, it's The Splash with Maddie Mushkin on My Michigan TV. It's Steve Lato Live, and we'll be back tomorrow at 10 a.m.